It's another morning here at the Keswick Convention as we gather together to be human, properly human, those who are dependent upon God's Word, those who are energized and animated by the work of the Holy Spirit, built up as living stones in the body of Christ. The work of the gospel embraces us, whether we're here in the tent, at one of our relay venues, or watching this meeting online, live or on catch-up. And so let's together ask God to enfold us with his grace, his goodness, and his giftings. Let's pray to that end as we bow our heads together. Father in heaven, please help us this day to be like that one in Jesus' parable who discovered treasure hidden in a field. May we be captivated by the truth of your gospel rejoicing over it, changed by it, giving all in order to obtain its goodness. Thank you that Jesus has given all to make your life in him available to us. Thank you for drawing us together with so many people around the world and across time, all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, let's, uh, let's stand and sing uh, that song that we were learning yesterday, Come Behold the Wondrous, Wondrous Mystery, which really focuses in on much of what uh, Jonathan will be unpacking in the passage that we're looking at this morning. So let's rise to our feet. Come. 
come behold the wondrous mystery Christ the Lord upon the tree in the stead of ruined sinners hangs the lamb in victory see the price of our redemption see the father's plan unfold bringing many sons to glory grace and measure love untold This week of convention is a great week. Beyond this week, please uh, do keep in touch. Be connected with what's going on here at Keswick Ministries. Have you signed up to receive the Keswick Ministries newsletter, for example? It will allow you to be the first to know about convention updates, things that are happening, teaching and training events throughout the year. You can sign up online or at the reception. Also, you can keep in touch with us through the year with social media. Please look at our website and pick up details there. For Christians in the workplace who want to support and help you, another of our meetups is happening today. This is an opportunity for those in the private sector to come together and discuss some of the encouragements, the challenges, the opportunities that you experience as Christians in your place of work and of standing and living for Christ there. It's 1.15 to 2.15, early afternoon, over in the pencil factory in room 101. The workplace, wherever we are, invites us into whole life discipleship. This afternoon, there's a call for church leaders to gather together to see how we can help support whole life discipleship amongst those in our churches. Joe Evans from Evangelical Alliance will be leading a workshop for those leading local church to think about how we can live for Jesus in every aspect of our lives and pastorally support people in our churches. You can join Joe at 2.30, again in the pencil factory, and again in room 101. One last thing happening today to point us to at this time, a foster care meeting. There'll be a lunchtime gathering for foster carers and for anyone who's interested in finding out more about foster caring. It's going to be in the Base Camp Cafe between 1 and 2 o'clock. Bring your lunch. There'll be a drink and a sweet uh, treat provided for you there. We've now got a video to watch about Keswick Ministries, its finances and its future. Well, good morning. I'm sorry I can't be with you this week, but it was such a thrill to be there last week and to see the tent so well filled. And also to know that people were engaging with the convention uh, on the live stream and also through the Relay venues as well. Now you'll be very much aware the convention is unique amongst other similar Christian events in there being no charge to attend. We want to celebrate our unity in the Lord Jesus by ensuring that all are welcome. And the fact that it's accessible to everyone, irrespective of their ability to pay, 
is an important part of our DNA. We're all one in Christ Jesus, as our banner declares. But of course, there is a cost in putting on the convention. Uh, and that cost is of the order of £1 million uh, for this year. And that figure excludes staff costs. It's a figure that's increased in recent years because of the inflation we've seen post-COVID. And I just want to uh, let you know what three of our largest costs are within that. Uh, the first is the cost of accommodating and feeding our army of 650 volunteers. And we're so, so thankful to them for the way in which they serve us. And the cost there is about £280,000. Secondly, we have technical costs, the cost of putting technical support into the, uh, the main marquee, into the children and youth venues, uh, and also the live stream as well. That's about £330,000. And then there's the cost of the marquee in which many of you are sitting this morning. That's about £100,000. All of that equates to about £135 for each adult attending the convention for one week. Now, we fully understand that not everyone is able to pay that, and that's perfectly fine. And we're so grateful to the many who give generously to enable everyone to attend. In terms of income received this year so far, we come into the convention probably around £40,000 behind where we had planned to be, where we expected to be. And so we would ask that however you're accessing the convention, uh, whether here in the main tent or through the live stream of the relays, if you would prayerfully consider how you might support this work financially to ensure that this unique event can continue into the future. And of course, if you're a taxpayer, to gift aid on top uh, to ensure that we receive another uh, 25% from the government. There will be a slide appearing uh, here and uh, it gives you an idea of some of the ways in which you can uh, give. You can give online. You can give using the QR codes that you'll find in a number of places dotted around the various venues. You can give through the giving station in base camp and you can pick up giving forms and put them in the receptacles that are at base camp and here at the back of the marquee as well. God has blessed this ministry over 148 years now through the generosity of his people. And we look forward with confidence to God continuing to bless this ministry for many more years to come. So thank you very much and may God bless you. Morning, everybody, and thank you to Steve and the team who do so much great work on the finance side of things. We're really grateful to them. I think we're at Thursday. <laughs> no idea what week it is, but I think it's Thursday. And uh, just a couple of practical things. We have sold out of some of the recommendations we've been making, um, but you can, whether you're watching online or perhaps you've, you've missed out here, you can shop online and still support the Keswick Convention. So if you go to tenofthose.com forward slash Keswick, uh, you can buy all the books at the, at the same deal and still support Keswick. And you can do that throughout the year, okay? So Christmas is about six months, so not long. So do uh, start doing that. Um, also, today and tomorrow, get pretty busy in the bookstore. So the sooner you get there, the better it is for everybody. Okay, um, some... Um, Reminders on, on the Keswick resources, you'll know that there's the undated devotions that they do, both um, through Bible books, but also themes. Make sure you pick, pick those up. And then the books as well. This one, a favorite of mine, Jeremy and Elizabeth McCoy, looking at the cross, the amazing cross. There's also a study guide that goes with this. A very, very helpful book. Make sure you check out the Keswick resources. And of course, the pack we mentioned at the start of the week, and then the uh, uh, autobiography I mentioned yesterday is in that. If you're going to buy what, uh, two of these, you basically make, get the pack uh, for cheaper than buying them all separately. So do get hold of those. Now, I'm often asked, what would you recommend for somebody kind of who's perhaps starting the Christian life or needs a bit of a refresher of, well, what does the Christian life look like? What does discipleship look like? This is not long out, but it's it's going to become the one that I point people to over and over again. It's really good. It's called Christian Essentials by a guy I've never heard of before. No idea who he is. But that, I think, is some of the strength of it. This isn't a celebrity writing, you know, and it's just a guy who's grounded in Scripture. And what he does is in each section, it walks you through the book of Acts, each section he takes that passage and puts it through in his own words. So it's 
really fresh. He then does a little Bible study with some questions there that you can work through, either for yourself or in a group. And then he practically applies it and walks you through it. And some of the practical implications he gives are a great prompt, just even from saying, you know, when did you last tell somebody how you became a Christian? And when you did it, what did you do? What did you share? What did you include? What did you miss out? And just helping us think through that. And he goes through nine areas of Christian essentials of what it is to be a disciple of Christ. I just think it's great. As I say, I've no idea who he is, but he's done a great job in presenting us with something that's really going to equip us. And uh, I'd encourage you to get hold of it. There's copies through in Basecamp. We'd love to serve you. Come and see us. Thanks. It's time now for us to still our hearts to receive from God's Word. I'm joined on stage by Anna Robson, who will read to us in a moment from Colossians. Ahead of then, let's pray together for our hearing, our heeding, and our living. Let's pray together. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Heavenly Father, we pray this morning for Anna's reading of Scripture for Jonathan's preaching of it, for our hearing and receiving from your goodness. Please, we ask you, feed us. Please feed into our testimony this day with your nourishment, your truth concerning Jesus and about ourselves in him. Please, we ask, feed into our lives, into the great work of Jesus in our churches to your glory. Amen. Amen. This morning's reading is from Colossians chapter 3, and we're starting at verse 1 and going through to verse 11. So that's Colossians chapter 3, starting at verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. But Christ is all and in all. Thank you, Anna, for reading for us so helpfully. As a Bible teacher, it's uh, gratifying to have interactions with folk and to hear uh, feedback from folk that gives indication that there has been a very careful listening to that which has been uh, preached. I've been grateful today for uh, messages I've had from a few from the southeast who have wanted just to remind me that the Waitrose is not in Tunbridge Wells itself, but in the town of Tunbridge, <laughs> with, a, with a backup location in Crowborough for those who are in the area and want to know. It's helpful just to be reminded that one's labor is not in vain. <laughs> Colossians 3, it's wonderful to be working through this rich book, Colossians 3, and the passage that was read 
for us. Friends, what is it that will make the difference for you and for me in seeking to live the Christian life, in seeking to do battle with sin, in seeking to grow in holiness, in seeking to become more like Jesus? What is it that's going to help us, how we need help? What is it that's going to spur us on? What is it that's going to move us forward. In chapter 2, Paul found it necessary to combat a brand of some false teaching in Colossae that had promoted worldly religion of rules and of regulations as the means to defeat sin and to grow in holiness. False teachers had been promoting these worldly techniques, regulations, verse 20, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, but Paul has shown us their emptiness and their powerlessness. Just notice how chapter 2 concluded. These things, these approaches, these techniques have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Now, if you've tried religion and techniques and self-driven discipline to help you to change, to conquer sin, to grow in holiness, you'll know that it is a hopeless exercise. You'll, you'll be familiar with that feeling of trying to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and achieving nothing. And so, Paul, he, he wants us to see the better way the hope-filled way, the truly effective way to change and to grow, to say no to sin and to become holier in life. I mentioned uh, last time that we'd been reading John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress at home, and I'm reminded here of the moment when the pilgrim, when Christian has been nearly diverted in his journey as he seeks to remove the burden of sin from his back, he was following the way that evangelists had sent him. But Mr. Worldly Wiseman had pulled him aside and had told him that the best thing for him would actually be now to change direction and to go and see Mr. Legality, who would teach him some wholesome rules and good behavior that would reform him. But Christian soon saw that the road to Mr. Legality's house was a hard road, up a steep and a dangerous hill, and his burden of sin just felt heavier looking at it. And at that moment, Evangelist came along and put him once more on the gospel path. Now, that is really the junction we reach here at the end of chapter 2 and the start of chapter 3. Paul is pulling us off the track of legalism and of worldly religion and putting us firmly on the gospel track to pursue holiness of life, true godliness and growth. He points us to the reality of Jesus' finished work and then to two responses that we must make. That's where we're going today. We begin then with the reality of Jesus' finished work. Notice it with me, chapter 3 and verse 1 again. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Paul changes gear away from the religious efforts of the false teachers, and he turns our attention now to Jesus and what has already taken place in him and through him. And right here, we've, we've got a lesson, don't we? Right here, we have an insight. The way to holiness, to victory, to change is not through anything that you and I can achieve. No, it is through Jesus and it is through what he has done. We don't look within for help because no resources of value can be found within us. No, we, we look to him. We fix our eyes on him. And here is what Jesus has done. 
Here is the objective truth. Here is what has taken place for the Christian through the work of Jesus. Verse 3, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, at this point, we are taken to the heart of Paul's understanding of our union with Christ. This is a key New Testament doctrine and one that Paul really majors on in his writing. The Lord Jesus died on a Roman cross 2,000 years years ago. And if you and I belong to Him, if we trust in Him, if we know Him as our Savior, here is what is true of you and is true of me. We died with Him too. The old me, the lost and sinful me, I died with Christ. The believer is so completely and truly joined to Jesus that what is true of Jesus has become true of us in this sense. He died, and so too did we. And that means that there has been a clean break from the old me. I died. The old me, the sinful me, is a thing of history, buried, dead. It has no future. It has no power of life, well and truly dead. But that's not all. Jesus not only died, He rose again, and if we belong to Jesus, we share in His resurrection life. Our new life is hidden with Christ in God. We are joined with Him. We are safe in Him. We are alive in Him. I think that one of the most helpful illustrations of this that I've ever heard actually came from a friend who has spoken here at Keswick on a number of occasions. Many will be familiar with Charles Price and his ministry here. Charles, many years ago, I remember this, gave the illustration of traveling in a plane, and I wonder if you'll find this helpful as I did. Just consider it with me. You may be a a happy traveler. You may be a very fearful traveler. You, You may sit there and just delight in the meals and in the snacks that come, or you're probably sitting in business if you like the food, or you may sit there with your air sickness bag at the ready. You may doze continually through the flight and and wake occasionally to catch five minutes of the film on your screen before dozing again. You you might sit there white-knuckled and gripped by fear the entire time. But the point is this. If you are in the plane and the door has closed behind you, whatever your state of mind, whatever your experience of the flight, what is true of the plane has become true of you. If you board the plane at Heathrow and then the plane pulls away from the gate, taxis down the runway, takes off, ascends to 30,000 feet, crosses the Atlantic, makes it to New York, lands at JFK, taxis to the gate, whatever your experience during that flight and within the plane, you do indeed fly from Heathrow to JFK, and what has been true of the plane has been true of you. You left the terminal at Heathrow because the plane left the terminal at Heathrow. You taxied down the runway because the plane taxied down the runway. You took off because you're in the plane. You ascended to 30,000 feet. You crossed the Atlantic. You landed at JFK, and you arrived at the gate. What was true of the plane in that journey was true of you. If you are in the plane, what is true of the plane in that journey has become true of you. Now, that is the broader theological concept and the broader truth that Paul is referring to and drawing upon. Those who belong to Jesus are in Christ, so that what is true of Jesus has become true of us. You have been raised with Christ, verse 1. And notice what that means for us. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Jesus rose from the grave. He ascended, and He is seated on high. And as a people who are joined to Him by the Spirit, there is a real sense in which we have been raised with Him too, not just from the grave, but to the heavens. It's a similar thought, isn't it, that Paul expresses in Ephesians 2 and verse 6, where he says that God raised us up with Jesus and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We believers, we are in Christ Jesus. And so our true home is above and not here below. Our true home is with Jesus, the one to whom we are joined by the Spirit, the one who even now is ascended on high. 
Now, these are, these are big thoughts. These are big claims. These are big theological truths. The fact that we who believe are united to Jesus in his death and in his resurrection and even in his ascension in some way, the fact that we are united with him in this way is a huge truth for us to try and comprehend. But what does all this have to do with the matter at hand, with the pressing issue at hand, with the desire, end of verse 2, to stop the indulgence of the flesh, to grow in holiness, to say no to sin? Why is our union with Christ relevant and significant here, and how is it going to make a difference for us? Well, consider with me, if, if you would, just for a moment, two types of video you might watch. Bear with me here and see if this might be helpful. If you're anything like me, you might from time to time watch a how-to video. You, you know, you've got a project you want to do, something maybe to fix around the house. You look up a DIY video on YouTube and someone walks you through how to do whatever it is you need to do. And they make it, they make it look so easy. Have you ever noticed that? So, so easy. And you just think, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to roll up my sleeves and I'm going to tear out a, a bathroom or rewire the house or put a new transmission in the car, <laughs> how hard can it be? And how empowered will I feel at the end of this? Inevitably, of course, the dream is shattered by the actuality and the outcome. I watched one of those DIY videos a little while ago and went to try and do the particular repair myself and promptly broke the equipment trying to copy the video. And in the end, it was more expensive and more hassle than if I just hired someone who knew what they were doing, hopeless. My family are used to this now. They just roll their eyes when they see that I'm trying this. My, my, my most noteworthy um, accomplishment of this kind actually came when we bought an old speedboat. We lived near a river. We lived near the Rideau River in Ottawa, which is a very beautiful river, and it's fun to get out on the water. And so I, I saw an ad for a very cheap and very old speedboat, 40 years old. It sounds glamorous. This is nothing glamorous. I think they should have paid us for taking it off their drive. <laughs> and inevitably, with something like that, there were a few things that needed fixing when we got it. And I, I realized that the, 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 the gear wire, the, there's a stick at the front, and you, know, you push forward to go forward and back to go back. It has a wire that connects to the engine at the back. That needed replacing. And I took it to the mechanic and said, you know, what will this, what's involved here? And they said, oh, that'll be probably $2,000 to fix that. And I thought to myself, no, 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 no. <laughs> So I turned to YouTube, and, I, <laughs> and it, look, it looked very easy. I ordered in the part from Amazon. And I spent three weeks, evenings for three weeks, crawling under the boat with bloodied and oil-soaked hands. It, it, overall, it went quite well. In fact, as long as you only needed to go forward in the boat, <laughs> it went incredibly well. But we've realized that most of the time, forward is good enough. You know, you don't water ski backwards. You don't go touring the river backwards. And when you need to land at a dock, you have small children who can stand on the bow of the boat, holding the rope and jump and catch the dock. Some might view that as dangerous. We think it's character building. <laughs> the how-to video, OK. That's one kind of video we might watch from time to time. Another kind of video that you might watch and one genre that I, I enjoy personally is the historical documentary. You know, a film chronicling the making of some aspect of the modern world or, or telling the story of a technological breakthrough or a great military victory. And in such a video, you might learn the story of a hero who achieved something truly great, a, a, a world achievement that, from which we all benefit. You know, Churchill and the Second World War, Edison and the light bulb, Pasteur and vaccines, you, get, you know, you get the idea. The first kind of video, it, it tells us what we might do. The second kind of video is all about what someone else has done for us. Now, the false teachers in Colossae were showing how-to videos for battling sin and growing in holiness. That's what the peddlers of worldly religion always show, always offer. It's all they've got, actually. At the opening of chapter 3, Paul's us, Paul shows us the grand sweep of what Jesus, our Savior, has done for us and in us. 
and he opens our eyes to see how this living Savior's finished work transforms and empowers our pursuit of holiness of life. See, Jesus has done something for us and in us that we could never do for ourselves. He's caused us to die to our old selves, our old way of life, The sinful nature, the flesh within us, it's it's still there, unfortunately. It still battles on. It still troubles us. Paul is realistic about that fact in the verses to come. But there has nonetheless been a decisive break. And there is a real sense, a true sense, in which the old me has died. More than that, the real me, the reborn me, the person that has been redeemed and remade by Jesus, that person has risen from the dead in Christ, and I have a new life. And I have a new power in Jesus. And not only that, my permanent address has changed too. This world, with all its corrupting influences and its draws and its enticements, with all its corrupting power, which seems to stain us even as we walk through it, like a muddy path on a rainy day, this world, it is no longer our home. Heaven is our home because Jesus has taken us there by faith and through our union with him. And there is another aspect to the work of Jesus. It's, it's not part of the documentary yet, because it hasn't happened yet, but it's, it's the final piece of his work, and it makes all the difference here. He not only died, he not only rose, he not only ascended, but he's coming back in glory. Verse 4, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory worldly religion, works-based religion, do-it-yourself religion, the kind of religion that the false teachers were pushing at Colossae. It's an inherently hopeless business because within a system like that, you can never have certainty about the future. Will God accept me in the end? Will, Will I ultimately be saved? Will I be cast away at the judgment? Well, it all... It all depends on my uh, behavior and upon my success in the work of self-reform. You see, that's always the message. And given the fact that I'm just not very good at improving myself and at modifying my behavior, holiness doesn't come naturally to any of us. And because of that, worldly religion must always lead to fear, to foreboding, to uncertainty when it comes to the future. But true gospel Christianity is utterly unlike that because our standing before God is based entirely upon the work of Jesus. And because Jesus joins his people to himself in an unbreakable way, because of this, we know already the outcome as a certainty. Jesus, who is our life, who is our everything, will appear on the clouds of heaven. He will gather his people to himself. He will cause us then to appear with him in glory. The outcome of the Christian life is a foregone conclusion. Jesus will appear once more in this world, and one day he will take us home. And so we rest secure. We are filled with hope. We have nothing to fear. Now, that is the wonder of the finished work of Jesus Christ. It is the basis of our holiness. It is the only cause for hope that we can actually change. But this finished work of Jesus, it doesn't lead to inactivity or to disengagement on our part, imagining that there is nothing to do. Quite the contrary, Paul turns now to our response to this finished work of Christ, to two responses that we must make. And the first one is this, number one, seek the things that are above. Seek the things that are above, verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. All of us will know the inclination to seek and pursue certain things at different stages in life to allow some focus more or less to sort of take over for a time or a season, you know, completing the degree, excelling at sport, maybe pursuing a romantic interest, perhaps driving forward your career. To some extent, we all know this. To some extent, we all do this. And Paul has an important instruction for us. Pursue, seek. The language in the original is quite pointed language. It speaks of aiming at and driving at. Seek the things that are above. 
rather than seeking and pursuing and driving at the things of this earth, possessions or achievements, rather than setting our sights on the things of this world where so often worldly pursuits involve the entanglements of sin, rather than do that, instead aim at, pursue, seek the things that are above. Jesus is above. We are united to Him by the Spirit, and so our true home is above. It's right and proper that our sights should therefore be set on things there rather than on the things of this world. That doesn't mean, by the way, that we just ignore this world or refuse to participate in this world. It doesn't mean that we become just detached and disengaged from the world around us. No, it means simply this. It means that our activity in this world will be shaped by our heavenly vision. Our priorities for the here and now are set by the agenda of heaven above. To put this same point in another way, Paul tells us to give attention to our thinking. Verse 2, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. I wonder what it is that your mind defaults to in adult moments. You know, when you're on a bus or on a train, when you're sitting at the, at the doctor's surgery waiting just to be called in, when you're just drifting off to sleep, when you just wake up in the morning, when you're not reading or talking or working, what is it that comes to mind for you and occupies your thoughts? Maybe, maybe it's a worry. Maybe it's a regret. Maybe it's a project or a dream. Maybe it's relationships or money or work or sport. I don't know what it is for you, but I guess you probably know. We might say that the things our mind defaults to, the thing our mind is most inclined to consider, those things are the things that our mind is set upon, the things we are preoccupied with, the things we are concerned about and care about. But if you're serious about following Jesus, growing in godliness, saying no to sin, Paul has an instruction and an admonition for us. He says, set your minds on things that are above and not on things that are on earth. And we hear that and we read that and we think, yes, Paul, good idea. Of course, of course, that's what I ought to do. But then reality hits. And we remember that the things of this world can be alluring and enticing and compelling to our minds and it's not so easy to remove them from the position of default interest. We remember that the concerns of this world can actually weigh very, very heavily upon us, and it's not easy to displace them from the position of default focus. You and I know full well, I think we're realistic enough to know, that shifting our focus from the things of this earth to the things above will take some kind of initiative, some kind of help. And here I think we don't turn to a magic formula, I'm afraid, to some special and mysterious insight that only the insider can know. No, here we turn to the bread and butter of the Christian life. We actually return once more to basics. And the main engine here is, of course, the Word of God. It's God's own voice as we hear it in the Scriptures. It's His Word that turns our attention heavenward and reminds us who it is to whom we belong and where it is that we find our true home. One of the most fascinating and in some ways impressive media organizations in the world is still the BBC. I, I know it's, it's imperfect and, and all the rest, but it is remarkable too on many levels. On a particular note, I think, is the World Service Branch, which reaches a massive global audience in 40 languages and more. The World Service, you may know, began in 1932 as the Empire service, and the idea was to reach English speakers throughout the empire. King George V gave his first Christmas address at the time of the launch of the service and said that the idea was to reach, I quote, men and women so cut off by the snow, the desert, or the sea that only voices out of the air can reach them. It was a voice from home, wherever in the world you found yourself, an opportunity even to hear from your king. You and I are to remember our home above, wherever we find ourselves on earth below, 
we need to be hearing regularly from our King. And wonderfully, He speaks to us wherever we are. He has given us His Word. And the simple truth is that we need to avail ourselves of that Word. We need to read it daily for ourselves. We need some kind of a rhythm of that in our own lives. We need to have the Word open in our homes with our families in one way or another. We need to gather with God's people to hear the preaching of the Word of God. I'm finding more and more I want to build other opportunities into my own life to hear the Word. I, I've, got a, I've got a playlist of Christian songs that just remind me of gospel truth, and I find listening to that just does me some good. I find having some podcasts with good Bible teaching available is such a help when I'm on a long journey or when I'm doing a job or around the house when I'm lying under the boat. <laughs> and alongside all that, we need to be other, with other believers, don't we? Other believers who will bring encouragement to us, who will speak God's Word into our lives and remind us of the truth. This is one reason why the pandemic season was so hard for us. You know, we had reduced and constrained opportunities to receive the encouragement that we need from one another and how we need that encouragement. And for those who haven't still fully re-entered the patterns of meeting with the people of God, of being at church, and I'm, I've actually been very struck as I've gone around the place by how many people have actually stayed out of the rhythm of church involvement since the disruption of the pandemic. If that's you, let me say to you, 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 you need it. You need it. You need to be among the people of God. If you're going to have your mind set on things that are above, you need the help of Christian community to do that. Friends, how, how we need to hear God's voice, how we need to feed on His Word, how we need to help one another do so because the gaze of our heart slips down from heaven to earth below so very easily. And as that happens, when that happens, we're so much susceptible to discouragement, to disillusionment, to temptation, and to sin. I'm a little embarrassed to admit that I had a bump in the car the other day, and it was enti entirely my fault. I was driving home from the office in heavy traffic, and I, I think I just I glanced down at something on the dashboard of the car, maybe just the speedometer, I'm not sure, but I glanced down just for a moment, a split second, and I looked up with fright the two cars in front of me had absolutely slammed on the brakes, and I, I just I couldn't stop quite quickly enough. Anyway, we pulled to the side, I and the driver in front, and, and actually the cars had barely touched. It wasn't bad, but the lady, she was so nice about it. There was no damage. We were both driving pretty old cars. I realized I wasn't going to get the insurance to write it off and give me a new one too bad. <laughs> None of us actually cared very much if there was... Uh, a scratch or anything, but there, it didn't seem like there was. We ended up having a lovely little chat, and then we went on our way. But I mentioned that to my embarrassment, because we get into trouble, don't we, when our gaze slips downwards. See, we got to keep our eyes up, not just on the road ahead, but on heaven above. The great gospel truth for the believer is that through Jesus, we have died to this world, and we have a new life got a heavenly home. Our, our response to these things first is to seek things that are above, to set our mind on things that are above, and second, our response is to put to death what is earthly, verse 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion and desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On one level, it might look as though there is a strange inconsistency in what Paul is saying here. Maybe you noticed it. Verse 3, he told us that we have died, died with Christ, died to this world. But now in verse 5, he tells us to put to death what is earthly in you. Well, hold on a second, Paul. Which one is it? Have we already died to this world, or do we need to put to death what is earthly in us? Surely it's one or the other, but no, Paul insists it's actually both. And in this, we come, to a, we come to a tension that lies at the center of the Christian life and that runs right through the New Testament. And it's the tension of the now and the not yet. You see, we are a people who have been saved, who are being saved, and who will be saved. In Christ, 
through His redeeming work at Calvary, through His life-giving resurrection, through His glorious ascension, we have been given all things. All has been accomplished for us. There's nothing more that we need, and yet we still await the outcome and the outworking of this salvation. On a day to come, He will save us from the presence and the experience of sin and evil once for all, and what a day that will be. We know Him. We love Him. We have been made holy in His sight, and yet we are still a sinful people, a people who fail and stumble and fall, made holy, yet needing each day to grow in holiness. Heaven is our home, but we live still here on earth. And in all these ways, you and I are a people living in tension, in something of a limbo. We live both in the now and the not yet of our salvation. Now, Paul, along with the other writers of the New Testament, can make very, very lavish statements about that which is true of us now in our salvation, while at the same time calling us to strive and to hope for that which is yet to come. And here is a case in point. We have died to the world, and yet we must actively put to death that which is earthly in us. And while the tension might seem odd on the written page, if we truly belong to Jesus, you and I know exactly what Paul is talking about, don't we? We know what he's talking about because we can see that which is earthly within us all too easily and all too readily. The tension he's talking about here is our struggle, our battle, the greatest internal tension of our lives for each one who believes. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. It is natural to the earthly person to seek satisfaction and fulfillment from indulging the appetites of the flesh, to try and find the longing of our heart's desire in that which the world affords. And of course, the world cannot satisfy the human heart. We were made for more, but it's natural to the earthly person to turn to sexual immorality, to impurity, to passion, to sexual indulgence for satisfaction. Now, Paul is going to talk about other earthly inclinations and sins, but he starts with a major focus here on sexual sin, and if we would wonder why he does that, we need only look at our contemporary world and our culture, which is not so very different from the ancient world, actually, and to see that humanity in sin is profoundly lost in sexual terms. Humanity in sin is compulsively sex-obsessed, in seeking to find satisfaction in this world and without reference to God, the earthly person turns here very quickly for fulfillment. And we can hardly pretend that we haven't noticed or that we are unmoved by these things in a highly sexualized culture with an over-sexualized media. You and I are confronted with these things all the time, every day. And Paul was wise enough to the human heart to know that we believers would face a constant battle on this front. And he was wise enough to say to us lovingly, put it to death. Put it to death. Avoid the compromising situation. Avoid the person. Avoid the place. Avoid the influence. Avoid the source of temptation. Avoid the media. Whatever it is, take the steps that are necessary to put it to death. Now, I don't know what that might mean for you, but I expect for those struggling, stumbling, perhaps failing in this area, I expect you know. And Paul says, take the drastic steps needed in the power of the Spirit and put it to death. Kill it, because if you won't be killing it, it will be killing you. I was out in a shed in our back garden a little while ago, tidying away some things, and I noticed uh, some movement over to my left, and I looked down, and I saw that I was sharing this shed with a nasty little snake. It was uh, actually decent enough to politely slither away under a gap in the wall and disappear quite quickly. But I, but I found myself reflecting upon what it is that one ought to do when a snake is in one's space. 
I don't think the snake was especially dangerous, but snakes can be, of course. And with the snake, you know, I think it's probably important not to engage with the snake unless you mean to kill it. I mean, giving the, the snake a friendly little tap on the head, that will lead to trouble. Playing with the snake, ditto. Trying to pick it up for a little chat, not advisable. No, it's got to be a fatal blow to the head with a shovel. <laughs> Sexual temptation is a python with its eyes upon us. We need to put it to death, says Paul. He now broadens out very slightly from sexual immorality in the middle of verse 5, and he speaks of evil desire. And that's, I guess that's pretty general. What are you desiring that you know is wrong, evil, ungodly, and then covetousness, hungering for more and more, desiring to have what your neighbor has, greedily longing for possessions and experiences that God has not actually given to you and assigned to you. And Paul sends, says, end of verse 5, that covetousness is actually idolatry. It is a God replacement that you worship as you pursue it. All this is earthly, and we need to take all drastic steps necessary in order to put it to death. We need to take drastic steps because sin is serious. It is because of this very ungodliness, verse 6, that the wrath of God is coming upon this world. The world says, of course, you know, sexual immor immorality, that's meaningless, unimportant, it would refrain from calling any desire evil. And as for covetousness, well, greed is good, says Wall Street. Greed is the engine of capitalism and drives it forward, but God says these are the very sins that call down judgment from heaven. These were the things that used to characterize our lives, verse 7. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but you and I in Christ, we died to the world. We died to sin. Jesus has made us new, and so we mustn't walk in them any longer. And here, here again, here's the tension. Paul knows that we need to hear this because he knows that these things still have a tug on our hearts. He knows that these temptations are real issues for the people of God. That's why he's addressing them. The Bible is immensely realistic. We might, you know, put on a, a pious front and pretend that no temptation ever touches our heart, but Paul is wiser than all that. Let's stop pretending, Paul insists. Let's get serious, and let's put these things to death. We might feel that the list of sins already given is quite enough for one day. You've been made to feel uncomfortable enough. Thank you very much. But Paul continues, and the pain increases as he moves from the sins of our own heart to focus on the matter of our treatment of one another, verse 8. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here are things we must put away anger, wrath. Anyone you're feeling angry with today? Is there a situation of hurt, a wrong, an injustice? It just rises in your heart whenever you think of it. And to be honest, you're actually, you're kind of nursing the anger just a little bit. You're nursing it, keeping it alive, because actually, if you're being honest, you feel entitled to that anger. Malice. Is there someone you actually would secretly like to do harm to in some way? Undermine their flourishing and their future to spite them for what they've done? Slander. Obscene talk. How do you speak of others, especially those whom you dislike? Those who've hurt you, those whom you resent or envy? How about lying? Ever tempted to massage, bend, reshape the truth? It's all pretty ugly stuff, isn't it? But Paul puts it before us because he's not so naive as to think that you and I don't need to hear it. Put these things away, says Paul. Stop doing them. Stop doing them, not least, because now in Jesus, verse 11, we have been made one. Divisions and barriers between us have been broken down by the gospel. 
There's a hard emphasis here, isn't there, on taking action, on concrete steps of obedience. We can't escape that fact, and we need to learn to take it seriously. The Bible gives us concrete instructions and commands, and you and I, we need space within our theology, within our Christian understanding, to be able to receive those commands of Scripture. You know, we don't, we don't just sit back in the Christian life and wait for God to do everything so that you and I are mere spectators in our own Christian life, like moviegoers watching a film of our own lives play out on the big screen while we eat popcorn and enjoy the show. Some friends took our son to the cinema the other day. These are very kind and generous people. And so they, they paid for the premium seats, premium seats in the cinema, which is something that others of us do not uh, do on, uh, under any circumstances <laughs> or on any occasion. But, but anyway, upon the return home, we heard the reports, reclining chairs set in, in some kind of personal pod, heated leather seats with built-in massage. The, I mean, the full, the full works. Dry, uh, snacks and drinks as well. I think he was thinking of putting himself up for adoption to this family. <laughs> he was explaining to us that this would be what was expected going forward. We explained to him that he should just enjoy the memory. <laughs> As believers, do we sit back and relax in comfort as spectators, just watching what the Lord will do in our lives? No. Uh-uh. The Christian life involves action, and it does involve effort. But Christian obedience is not the same as what the legalist prescribes. You and I, we don't seek to obey in order to be saved. We seek to obey because Jesus has cleansed us in His grace through His death on the cross. We, we seek to obey because in Him, you and I, we died to the world, and in Him we have been made new. This is the outworking of our salvation, the outworking of our union with Christ. It is not the basis of anything. Now, you and I, we're not alone in this, and we don't act in our own strength. We have put off the old self, verse 9, in Christ through His saving work, and we have put on the new self, verse 10, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And here at this point, Paul takes us full circle. He takes us back to where we began at the start of our passage, at the start of the chapter. We're a people united to Christ. We're a people in Christ, and that means that everything has changed just follow the flow of Paul's thought here again at the close of the passage, verse 9. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Why shouldn't you and I lie to one another? Well, because in Christ we died. We, we put off the old self, and in Christ, by the Spirit, we are being renewed, made even like the one who made us and who now indwells us. Why shouldn't we lie to one another? Because we're all together, united in Christ. We're united to Him. As the Kazakh banner has reminded us for countless generations, we're all one in Christ Jesus. We're all in the plane together. When you're on the flight from Heathrow to JFK with 400, 500 other people, there might be 150 nationalities on that flight and people from all walks of life, but you're all in the plane. You're all headed to the same place. Here in Christ, the fundamental thing about us is not our ethnicity or religious history or social position, but there is one thing about us that really matters. Christ is all and in all. We're in Christ. We have been raised with Christ. Christ dwells within us by the Spirit. And this gospel truth, this is the gospel reality of what Jesus has done for us. This is the key to life transformation. This is the foundation. This is the enabling. This is the everything. What's true of Jesus has become true of us gloriously in the gospel, in and through our union with Him. But friends, all this, it doesn't mean that we just put our feet up, that we let go and let God, that we kick into neutral and coast from here on in. No, not a bit of it. 
earlier this morning, I was chatting with a, a brother, and, and he said to me, you know, how do, we, how do we make progress? How do we deal with sin? How, would, how do we grow in godliness? How does this actually work out? And I said, well, we're going to try and talk about this this morning from Colossians 3. But as we were chatting, the thought came to mind, and we, 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 we chewed this over a little bit together just outside. The thought came to mind, you know, of those, those new um, motor-assisted bikes. Maybe some of you have those. Now, with the motor-assisted bikes, you got to pedal. you got to do something. But as you do something, you find that there's another power coming alongside you and helping you. And that is the dynamic of the Christian life, isn't it? The Lord doesn't say, do nothing, sit back, and I'll do it all. The Lord says, I am with you. I am in you by your spirit, and you are in me. Now pedal. What do we do? In the power of the spirit of Christ working within us, we set our minds on things above. And by his strength, we put to death daily that which is earthly within us. May the Lord help us, strengthen us, and give us his grace in these things. Friends, let's pray together as we close. Father, we thank you that we are united to our Savior in such a way that we have died, and we are raised with him, and our true home is above. Thank you for the gift of your Spirit to strengthen and enable us to live the Christian life, which in and of ourselves, is entirely beyond us. Give us grace to put to death that which is earthly within us and to fix our heart and our mind and our eyes on that which is above, where our Savior is seated on high. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's uh, respond in song by singing... O oh, great God of highest heaven, occupy my lowly heart, own it all and reign supreme, conquer every rebel power. Let's rise as we sing this song together that picks up so much of those themes from our passage this morning.
Please do be seated. We've just sung that God, by his Spirit, has opened his word to us. I hope that's true for each and every one of us, whether we're here or watching elsewhere, as we've heard God's word taught to us. In Jesus, there is grace and truth to be authentically human. If you're in Christ, if you're in that plane, then don't just rush into the day now. Consider your place in him, unified to him. We thought about taking steps, concrete actions, the next step, renewed in the image of our creator and the knowledge of that. If you're here this morning and you want to pray with someone individually about that next step, the step that you know from hearing God's word to your heart and your mind, you need to take or keep on making, then please come down to the front, to the right-hand side of the stage, where our prayer team will willingly listen and pray with you. Now together, let's conclude collectively in prayer to our great God and Father. Heavenly Father, thank you for the finished work of Jesus. Thank you for union with him. Thank you for the old self nailed to the cross 2,000 years ago. Please help us this day to put off, to rid ourselves of earthly things daily. Please may the old self be no more. Please help us to put on the garments of Christ, the fragrance of Christ, union with him. Help us to find our true self, past, present, future in him. And so, Heavenly Father, for each of us, help us to seek with our heart and know the promise of your word that in Christ you will find. Help us set our minds on things above, knowing the promise of your words that Christ is coming again, that your word is not void, that the Spirit bonds us to Christ. Help us this day to rejoice and to return to our places, even this day where we serve him as truly human in Christ. Amen. May your day be good in him, whatever it brings.